You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 214, our 26th question and answer episode. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Pretty good. It's been hectic, but, you know, that's better than being bored, I guess. I hear you. And also, if you're listening to this, listeners, we are actually currently in Israel right now, Mike. This is week right. one of Israel. So, shalom. I can hardly wait. I know, Shalom. I can <laughs> hardly wait for. Oh uh, yeah, you know. Yeah. Are you Are you prepared? Have you got all your no notes, no. bullet points? No. You just gonna. No, I finally it. got. I got back from the April travel, and now I have a few days to scramble. So. Yeah. You know, it is what it is, but I'm I'm sure it'll be fun, and you know, hopefully not overbearingly hot and safe, of course, but. I, I told my mom, you know, my, my mom's like, oh, you know, you don't go over there. You know, look, it's just a, this horrible this and that. And I said, look, I'm going to I'm going to be with two FBI agents and trays like the size of a defensive lineman. <laughs> so, <laughs> I should be OK. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, hopefully we're having a good time there. When we get back, we'll let everyone know um, how it went and what you said and give a sure. report. So we're yeah, looking for that. that. We'll, that'll, we'll that'll, give the update. Yep. Yeah, that'll happen in the probably uh, three more episodes from now. So what we're going to do is over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to have three Q and a episodes to uh, cover our trip while we're gone. So be expecting three Q and a episodes coming your way, Mike, and here's Q and a number 26. So I'm ready with sure. questions. If you are sure. All sure. Right. Shoot. Our first one's from ghost man. And he wants to know, what is the meaning of Ecclesiastes 3.21? Yeah, and for those of you who don't have your Bible memorized completely, <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3.21 in ESV says, Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? Question mark. Again, this this rhetorical question. You know, I, I think in a nutshell, the, the point of the verse is that human beings are mortal, just like the beasts. Okay, if you go back, you know, to verses nineteen and twenty, you know, the couple of preceding verses, you read, you know, something to the effect that all of them, both human and animal, all have the same breath. Everything is meaningless. You know, says the writer, Kohelet, uh, Ecclesiastes, the preacher. All go to the same place. In other words, they all go to the grave. Everything dies. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Then we get this statement, well, you know, who knows if whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth. So the, the, the real question here is the author is, is wondering if people, if any people, wind up being taken out of the grave, you know, out of Sheol, because everything— goes there. Everything dies, which is pretty self-evident. And this verse is part of the whole discussion in the Old Testament about Sheol, because, you know, everybody dies and everything dies. So on my website, you know, years and years ago, boy, it's, it's I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, whenever it was, uh, I went through a, a series on Sheol and the human dead versus the non-human, you know, spirits, you know, that are in, you know, Sheol and who's in Sheol and all that kind of stuff. And so we, we, you know, discussed broadly, you know, this whole topic, but this verse in particular is part of that that complex of ideas. And you know, what you get as you read through the Old Testament is you get this notion born of reality, that everybody dies. And then there's this sort of question like, well, well, then what? Because even in Sheol, you have this conscious life going on. You know, I'm, you, people would, would say, I'm going to go be with my fathers. Well, you know, that reflected the idea that you would rejoin, you know, your, your family members. People were buried. You know, we talked about Old Testament view of the afterlife. And, and again, I'm, I'm one that doesn't think that Israelites thought there was nothing going on or soul sleep or anything like that because they would be they, people would be buried with things that they used in life 
uh, under the assumption, you know, that they would use them in the next life. I mean, Israelites weren't any different than lots of other cultures in this respect. Uh, people just anticipated to have some sort of existence. But if you were a Mesopotamian, you would sort of view this existence as kind of cadaverous, you know, nothing really good. If you were an Egyptian, uh, you viewed it a little bit differently, depending on which era of uh, Egyptian history and you know, the theology that went with it was in. Uh, sometimes the positive afterlife was just for the Pharaoh and whoever he granted it to. But it, eventually it, it widens, you know, to, to more people. And, and Egyptians were, you know, quite noteworthy for their positive outlook of the afterlife. So, you know, Israel's part of part of this mix. It, when it comes to the biblical writers, uh, again, there's there's in some passages, there's a question, well, you know, like, we don't really know what's going to go going to go on. And in other passages, it's actually positive that there are Old Testament passages. And again, in that series I did on my website, uh, you could you could look them up. But there are, there are, you know, Old Testament passages that have a positive view of the afterlife because it's anticipated or at least hoped for that the righteous, you know, those who have a, a, a right relationship with Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, would be removed from Sheol. Yes, everybody goes there, but you know the righteous are going to be removed from it. So that the you know the writer of Ecclesiastes is sort of in that mix. Um, Ecclesiastes is 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 kind of a an unusual book to begin with because there, parts of it are really cynical and pessimistic, and other parts of it are are optimistic. And so scholars always discuss Ecclesiastes with the question, well, is it a pessimistic book or is it an optimistic book? And it, it's it's some of both. Uh, and again, and th this question kind of reflects that. I want to read uh, something from uh, Provan uh, about this particular passage. He wrote a commentary on Ecclesiastes. It's in the NIV application commentary series. So, you know, looking up Provan here, he writes, The one place to which all the living go is Sheol, the, wor the world of the dead. For example, Job 30, 23, the place appointed for all the living. In other words, all the living are eventually going to be among the dead. They're going to die. It's translated in the NIV simply as the grave in Ecclesiastes 9.10. The Old Testament often speaks of death as if it were a final ending to human existence, a place of separation from God. And he gives a few psalms here, Psalm 6.5, 88, 10 through 12. Uh, it's a place of separation from God that the righteous as well as the wicked will experience as darkness and chaos and from which they will not return. Again, everybody dies. You're not going to that there was no sense that when you died, well, maybe you'll be undead at some point. You know, that, that, that wasn't a question, just like it is for us, you know, on, on one level anyway. Other texts, however, tell us that the wicked depart to Sheol, Psalm 9, verse 17, Psalm 30, 31, 17, implying that the fate of the righteous is ultimately, if not immediately, different. A point explicit in Psalm 49, 13 through 15, where the righteous are ransomed from Sheol's power. And he has a cross-reference cross -reference here to Psalm 16, 10, and 11. Job 14, 13 pictures Sheol as a place in which God might hide Job until his wrath has passed, the passage envis envisaging a later time when God will remember him and the dead will be roused out of their sleep. That's also Job 14, 12, verses uh, and also verses 14 through 17, the same chapter. And of course, the, the famous Job 19, 25 through 26, that's the I know my Redeemer lives passage. In passages like Isaiah 26, 19 and Daniel 12, 2 and 3, moreover, there are clear references to resurrection from the dead. Uh, that's the end of uh, Provence quote. So in other words, there are clear references to being removed from Sheol. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes here is sort of expressing either a non-committal ignorance or a pessimism. You know, that, that's reflected by his words. Well, who knows if, so on and so forth. Provana elsewhere says, the writer cannot be certain what will happen after death. It is unseen. He rests content with that which, in the grace of God, he has come to see. Namely, that death renders pointless during life the quest for gain or advantage over the rest of creation. So. It's the end of the, of the second quote there. So Provan is saying, you know, the, the writer, at, at the very least, he's sort of saying this in the context of the fact that everybody dies and death is ultimately going to sort of be the, the great leveler. 
And so why should we waste our lives, you know, after ill-gotten gain and taking advantage of other people, so on and so forth? Because uh, he's going to end the book with this is the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments. But during the course of, the, of Ecclesiastes, you know, he asks questions like this and expresses either pessimism or you know, some sort of cynicism. Now, another way to look at this is, or at least uh, you know, part of, of the discussion of this kind of statement in Ecclesiastes is the whole issue of progressive revelation. Why would we assume, this is important, because you know, as people are listening to this, they might be thinking, well, shouldn't the writer of Ecclesiastes know that the righteous go to heaven? And why is it even a question? Well, it, it, it's a question because not every biblical writer sort of would have known at the same time. Uh, this is, if you think about it, what, you know, we're, we're fond as evangelicals of, of sort of touting the Bible as this book, you know, collection of 66 books were, you know, written over you know, a couple of millennia and all this kind of stuff. Well, it is. It is all that. But all those people obviously didn't live at the same time. Why would we expect that all biblical writers had the same grasp of some point of theology if they all lived over the course of a couple millennia? Why would we expect that they all had the same knowledge pool in their heads to draw from? That's an unrealistic and frankly an unbiblical assumption, but it's a common one, you know, for the average, you know, church person because, well, their, their writings show up in the Bible, so they all like believe the same thing, right? Well, you know, maybe when you when you meet, if you could assemble them all in heaven, well, then there'd be agreement. But in in real life, in real time, there are doctrines even within the Bible itself that develop that grow, that get, that get accrued to. It's not just one knowledge dump in Genesis 1, and then everybody sort of knows the same thing, you know, throughout the course of human history and, and all that. Again, with th this question, again, like so many others, sort of dovetails and is influenced by what I have contested uh, on many occasions to be a deeply flawed view of inspiration, the one that, one that sort of eliminates the humanity from it. And in this case, there's just no reason to expect biblical writers to have the same grasp of, of really any given subject at the same time, especially you know, when they lived in, in such a broad range you know, chronologically. Revelation, information from God, is given over time. It, it's a self-evident thing, but it's, it's something that, again, evangelicals often don't think about at all. But it's true. Material is added to theological threads. Part of our job as Bible students is to trace the threads. Anyone living after the time of the writer could provide a better answer because they had more revelation. People living further down the road, like let's just say in the New Testament, are going to be able to answer certain questions better than certain people in the Old Testament, just by definition, because revelation is given progressively. Uh, as just a, another example, or, or I guess a related example here. In the Mosaic era, you know, the dead, you, you see this phrase, the dead go to be with their fathers, again, this afterlife notion with loved ones. That's different than the wording here in Ecclesiastes 3.21 about going up. Okay, remember Ecclesiastes 3.21, you know, who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. Well, we know that everybody, everybody's spirit goes down into Sheol, but the question is, does the spirit of man you know, go upward? That up language is different than I'm, I'm going to die now, I'm going to go be with my fathers. You know, because you know, people were, were, they had different ways of expressing the notion of an afterlife, but here you have this directional element that sounds to our ear more like you know, heaven. So, and, I, and I think there is this sort of, uh, God attachment to the upward language as opposed to just a general afterlife you know, with loved ones kind of feel that you get in, in the Torah, for instance. So you have certain ideas that in parts of Scripture are going to conform to the upward language, other ideas that are going to conform to the, again, you know, positive afterlife uh, expectation, but not necessarily this upward orientation. Fox, uh, in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, Michael Fox was my advisor at Wisconsin. He writes this. He says, the writer is aware of the belief that at death, the soul goes upward to the heavens rather than down to Sheol. So he's aware of the idea. This idea is not Semitic in origin, but it was found in popular Hellenistic religion, which held that the soul arises to the ether, the heavenly seat of the gods. Now, I would, I would actually 
quibble with that because of the Psalms language about being with the Lord, you know, having the Lord take you out of Sheol. Well, if the Lord takes you out of Sheol, where is he going to take you? He's going to take you to be with him and he's in the heavens. And so that would be upward. So I, I don't think, I think Fox is giving in a little bit too quickly to this Hellenistic idea. Now, as the writer of Ecclesiastes portrays things, Fox says, the sage, again, the writer has heard of this notion, but he doesn't know for sure if it is true, and he refuses to be comforted by the conjecture. Again, I think it's a, a bit overstated. Uh, is, it, is it really a lack of comfort, or is he just being sort of cynical? Uh, or or, or his, is he just saying, hey, I don't know? Again, th- those, are, those are three related but different things. So I read Fox here because that, he's kind of the, the, the broad consensus kind of position on this. But Provan, again, is a little more positive because of the language in the Psalms. And again, it stands to reason if God is going to take you out of Sheol, he's going to take you to be with him. And that is a pre-Hellenistic, and it is a Semitic idea. So I wanted to throw that in to address, again, the, the consensus thinking. Consensus thinking, uh, I would say, is, is not terribly coherent, at least in its consistency. Now, as time goes on, the two ideas of positive afterlife, you know, in some sense, you know, being not being left in Sheol, that idea, and then this, this upward with God kind of orientation, those two ideas are fused in the Second Temple period in the New Testament, and their joining is logical from the Old Testament. Again, what other source of ongoing life would there be but with God? So here, this is a good case, and I think you have instances like the doctrine of Satan. Uh, you know, a few other things in the angelological and demonological sphere that the Second Temple period literature and the New Testament will say things that they'll, they'll essentially take data points from the Old Testament and then connect the dots. But the dots are not connected in the Old Testament. They're connected later. But, but the connection points, the data itself, the data that themselves are quite consistent with the Old Testament because the Old Testament is their source. And the connections that are made are coherent and logical. It's just that you don't find the connections. You don't find the picture, the mosaic in the Old Testament. You find it later. And I think this is kind of an example of one of those uh, sorts of topics. Okay, Mike, this next question, and I've been working on my Croatia pronunciation, is... uh, (laughs) You need to work a little harder. (laughs) uh, Yeah, Ante. (laughs) It's Ante from Croatia. I hope I did that right, sir. So. All right, he's got two questions, and his first one is, can you give a few examples where Jesus uses Jewish doctrines developed in Second Temple period that are not explicit in the Old Testament? Well, that, that, that's an interesting juxtaposition, juxtaposition in light of what I just said, yeah. Um, I mean, you, you do have broadly, I brought up Satan. Again, the, the, the full picture of Satan is going to be different. Uh, you know, in Second Temple and New Testament, but but to be more specific, you know, to to the question, examples where Jesus uses Jewish doctrines. Again, I would I'd quibble with the wording. I mean, Jesus isn't looking to use Jewish doctrines, but he he's he's going to be part of 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 the world, part of a world, you know, that that has connected these dots. And the, the dots come from the Old Testament, but they're not connected in the Old Testament. They're connected later. So I think that's a, even that is a helpful way to think about it. But here's a, here are a couple of examples. The phrase in Matthew 25, 41, about the lake of fire being prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, that is, is an idea, this, uh, the association of this place of torment, place of punishment, you know, that might you know be eschatological across the board, but to associate it specifically with the devil and his angels, as though the devil has a bunch of angels that work for him. Okay, that's not something you're going to find in the Old Testament. You're going to find the devil, the Satan figure. You're going to find other fallen, uh, you know, divine beings that would be on the same team, as it were, with Satan. But you're not going to find verses that actually specifically connect them, like Satan is the captain and here's his team. You're also not going to find uh, this description that specifically the afterlife uh, place of punishment, the one that's sort of made permanent, you know, this this lake of fire thing that we see that at the end of, of the final judgment you know, where they're cast into it and, and there they go. You're not going to see the underworld really cast as 
a, a lake of fire. There, there are little, there are little glimpses uh, of things like that. You certainly get the idea of punishment, where Satan is is cast down to the underworld. You certainly get that. Uh, it, Jewish tradition, which is built off of, again, not only Old Testament but also uh, Second Temple stuff, like about the, the the fallen sons of God of Genesis six one through four. Since the Apkalu, which is the original Mesopotamian story for those four verses, since the Apkalu wind up being imprisoned in the abyss. That's where that idea comes from. And the writer of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 sort of assumed you knew the backstory. He doesn't discuss the backstory. It gets discussed a lot later in the intertestamental period, second temple period. All that you get in the Old Testament are the Rephaim, which again are, are part of the, 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 the giant you know, thinking in Old Testament uh, theology. You see them in Sheol, but you don't ever have a verse where they're like working for Satan, like what's my job today, boss? You know, you, you never have this explicit association. You do have this place that's that that if you're left there, if you have no hope of escape, that's bad because who's who are your neighbors now? Who are you living with? Well, you're living with the, the, the original fallen, you know, rebel of Genesis three, the Satan figure. You're also living with the, the spirits of the giant clans, which are, are demons in Second Temple thought. You, that's really not great. You know, I mean, can I can I find a better neighborhood? Well, the answer is no, because if you're left in Sheol, that means you're you're one of the unrighteous. So, again, you you have all you have these ideas, you have these data points floating around in the Old Testament, but they're never put together. And it, later on in the Second Temple period, you get the dots connected, and the dots derive from the Old Testament, and they make sense in light of what you read in the Old Testament. They're just not connected the way you're reading you know, them here in Matthew twenty five, forty one or in a second temple passage. It's the same thing for exorcism of demons. You don't have this in the Old Testament. In fact, you barely have the expectation of the Messiah being someone who would exorcise demons. We did a whole episode on this on the podcast. It's episode eighty seven. Where does this expectation come from that the Messiah would be someone who would cast out demons? When you have like zero reference to, to exorcism in the Old Testament. It's built off one or two, you know, things that you find in one or two Old Testament passages, and that get, you know, applied in this way. You know, certain little points of language get applied to the idea of the the, the son of David, the Davidic descendant, having power uh, over over demons and over over evil spirits and things like that. So it it there's an idea again. Jesus obviously in the Gospels, you know, does exorcism on a number of occasions. You have the sort of the, the kernel thoughts and the data points in the Old Testament, but you have no sort of explication uh, of those things, of the idea. You have no, no, nothing that states these connections in the Old Testament itself, but then later on, you do during the Second Temple period on into the New Testament. So there are things like this, again, that develop. And I'll go back to my question, to the previous question, why would we ever expect all of the biblical writers to know exactly the same things? At the same time, you know, or 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 having lived so far apart, and you know, again, why would we have this expectation that everybody knows the same thing? Well, the, the short answer is because that's what we're taught in church. Okay, that's not the correct answer. It's not a coherent answer. Again, we we just sort of make this assumption that everybody knows the same thing, and, th and then when when they know it and they write something, it's it's like all written at the same time, and everybody has a Bible. You know, folks, I I, I hate to again, try to disabuse listeners of this idea. But it wasn't until the modern era, post-printing press, and even then, you you know, you got to go a few centuries afterwards. It, it's only in the modern era that you could pretty much assume that the average person, despite their station in life, would actually have a Bible. That is not true in the ancient world. And so these assumptions that, that we, we look at biblical characters, we look at biblical writers, and, and we sort of expect them to just be able to look something up or just to automatically know it because they're a prophet. Well, they, they know every, that, all that stuff that somebody else wrote because they're a prophet. Well, again, that, that doesn't make any sense. They don't have the information downloaded into their heads. Most of them will never you know, pick up a, a, anything that you could call a Bible. It's, that's, this is why prophets exist. Prophets are the oral covenant enforcers. They, this is why you have, quote, schools of the prophets in the Old Testament, so that they can share information. Uh, you know, they, they can take what is written, and it's not a whole lot, 
and then they can you know be taught by the prophet they can pass that on because prophets need to be succeeded uh, this is how it works it's not like our time when you can just look stuff up and everybody's got a bible it's just not the way it is all right his second question is what would you as an old testament expert say what are the best arguments from the old t old testament for jesus being the promised prophesied Messiah, besides stating that it is Messianic mosaic, and compare it with what usually Christians say. And what are the most effective scripture to share with a religious Jew, and what are effective with the atheist? All right, let's just take one at a time. I mean, this might be disappointing, but, you know, honestly, I honestly don't know what else Jesus would have to do to, to validate his status as Messiah. In other words, the me as an Old Testament expert, I would say, go read the New Testament, you know, and, and align what Jesus actually does with the Old Testament scriptures. I could add the incarnation because the incarnation is absolutely essential to the messianic profile because only God could fulfill the covenants that God made with man. So the only way to make that happen is if God becomes a man, because humans are going to fail. Covenants that are made with humans, if God doesn't become a man and fulfill them himself, they're never going to get fulfilled because humans fail all the time, with regularity, unceasingly and unfailingly. So the incarnation is sort of a wild card element here. But honestly, what else would Jesus have to do? You know, I'm just being bluntly honest, because I, I this is kind of a familiar question. Well, how do we know Jesus? Well, what else would he have to do? And sub-question is, who else did that? Who else did? Who else fit the profile other than Jesus? And Jesus fit the profile really well. So what's missing? I would suggest to you nothing's missing. There's plenty of information there for you to draw the accurate conclusion that he was the Messiah. If you know what he did in the New Testament, you you, you check back on the Old Testament. So if you run into a person that just, well, I don't know, know, their their problem isn't really Jesus. Their problem is, is, I'll be so audacious to say this, they probably don't know what they're looking at if they read the New Testament. They, they probably haven't spent enough time actually reading it. And then once they read it, actually cross-referencing the Old Testament passages. And then it, it gets a little tougher sometimes to conceptually understand what's going on between the connections of how a New Testament writer would repurpose an Old Testament passage, you know, what, what he would see in there. That, that takes a little bit more work. But typically, this is the kind of question that, that again, I'm, I can only speak for myself, my own experience. This is the kind of question you get from people who just don't want to believe it. And and they, they don't really put a whole lot of effort uh, into, you know, reading both Testaments evaluatively and then asking the other question, well, who else fits the profile? The answer would be, well, really nobody. And then if you throw the incarnation in there, well, then it's really nobody because the incarnation is essential. So if we're talking about the way it's presented for most Christians, they, I think probably the incarnation might get, uh, I won't say skipped, but but sort of not fully appreciated for for the necessity of the incarnation. Now, the other questions, something to the effect of, you know, what, what's the most effective passage to share with a religious Jew, uh, I guess, to convince them Jesus was the Messiah? I, I, would, I would go to the two powers stuff, honestly. It's, it's one of the reasons why I've camped on it. In other words, a, a religious Jew has to be prepared, or at least have to, has to understand how his ancient compatriots, his ancient, you know, forefathers— could have accepted the worship of Jesus and not feel that they were violating the Shema, which is the fundamental tenet of Judaism. You know, the Lord our God is one. You have to show them how that worked, how that how that often worked and could have worked in the ancient first century Jewish mind. So you would want to introduce into passages that reinforce what scholars call Jewish binitarian monotheism, because that that's really what was going on in the first century. There were a lot of Jews prepared for the notion of a binitarian, you know, two powers, binitarian godhead. And all of the Christians were doing, the Christians weren't inventing anything new. They were just saying, we believe that the second power is Jesus of Nazareth, and, and here's why. Um, so the, I would take uh, a religious Jew to that, because they, they're, they're going to balk at the notion of, you know, if I convert to Christianity, I'm, I'm somehow dissing or, you know, giving up denying the Shema, and they're really not. So they, they need to understand what first century Jews were thinking. As far as the atheists, atheists don't care about Scripture, so there is no passage. Why would we assume that, that I'm going to quote a passage of Scripture to an atheist that's going to make any difference at all? 
Uh, I, I would say with an atheist, you need to get atheists to probe their own views and their own ideas, seriously probe them for their, their, their weaknesses in terms of coherence. Um, you know, tell them why you don't find atheism persuasive. Tell them, you know, or ask them, hey, why, why is it, I file this under, are you an honest atheist, okay? I would recommend, you know, having these, these conversations about how honest an atheist they are. And here's what I mean. Why is it, you know, if I'm sitting across the table from an atheist, here's what I really want to know. Why is it that someone with exactly your education went to your school in your field educated by the same professors you know you you were and 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 your faculty okay you have you have have people who were educated by the same people that educated your faculty who don't buy atheism they don't find it persuasive at all rather they find theism and christianity very persuasive so so what i want to know is have you really thought about how this isn't an intellectual position that it's really not about who's smart and who's dumb because I can, I can, you know, you can, you can show people you know, hard sciences. There are thousands, ten thousands, of people in the hard sciences who are educated at the same universities. They have the same PhDs. They're published in the same journals. They write or co-write for the same publishers. You know, they 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 go to the same conferences. They belong to the same scientific organizations. Their papers are cited just as often as somebody else's, and they are Christians. Okay, why is that? Can you explain that to me, Mr. Atheist? I want to know if you realize, if you've come to grips with the fact that there are many people just like you and the people who taught you that find your atheism completely unpersuasive. Why is that? If you really think about it, they've only got a couple of choices. They have to say, well, all those other people are deceived. All those other people are lying. Well, good. You're an, you're an atheist, and you want to depend on on you know empirical research. So, where are the studies for that? Can you show me a study that 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 proves empirically, scientifically, that all of these other people are deceived and all of these other people are lying? Can you show me that? Okay, they obviously can't. And what what you want to do is you want to you want to get them to start thinking about, well, why do I really why do I adopt this position? And oftentimes it's because they've met one Christian or maybe 10 Christians that are just jerks. Uh, the Christians have done them wrong. They have some, some problem of pain, just more broadly speaking, and they're blaming God for that. And, and that's when you can, you know, Lord willing, with, with the pain issue, you can, you can you know, help them to realize, well, lots of other people have gone through exactly the same thing. And that's not to excuse it, but it is to say that, you know, you, you, have, a, you have a group here, you know, that you know, sort of becomes your, your peer in, in, in this regard. You know, people who have suffered exactly the same thing and they know it's horrible, but, but they process it a different way. So the question is really about processing it. Why do, they, why do they process it this way and you process it another way? You know, atheism, I, I think it, what, you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to show the atheist that at the end of the day, their position is no more intellectual than anything else, than theism or Christianity. They're, they're winding up in their position for some other reason. And and maybe the best you can do is just have that conversation with them, and then if they were burned by Christians, you know, then then you need to be the counterexample. You need to have you have the best relationship with that person you can possibly have. You need to affirm them in any way that you can uh, to to help defy the stereotype or sort of undo or at least be be a living apology for what happened to them. Because typically it's about pain and it's, it's about anger. You know, with with the atheists, but a lot of them are, just have never really at all taken the time. They just assume a position of intellectual superiority, and they've never actually thought about the kind of questions you know I just brought up here. But but quoting a scripture, then that's not going to do anything. In fact, that's what they expect. That's what they expect, and they're they're just going to dismiss that. It's only after they've thought and processed about why they're making the decision that they do that if they if they you know can can at least you know cross the road to theism then then things like appeal to, to scripture might might be something that's really useful but at, from the gate at the outset we have no reason to to suspect that that's going to move them at all but and I'll admit you know we don't know what's going on in their heart of hearts you know maybe in the, in the word of god you know god can take his word and use it in, in some specific way but to just sort of randomly quote something about them to defend yourself 
That's what they expect. They expect you to defend yourself. They don't expect you to really politely insist that they defend themselves and their thinking. And if, if you have a sincere one, if you have an honest one, they should not be afraid to do that. And you just take them through, the, through, through questions like the examples I just gave. Chris in Baltimore, Maryland has a question about John 3, 13. The King James Version reading has, quote, Son of man who is in heaven, end quote. One, is it possible this is the correct reading? And two, if so, is this a reference to the Son of Man of Daniel 7? I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm following the question. Um, let's just look at it this way. I don't know of any other readings that don't say Son of Man, like that, that would say something else. For instance, Son of God or something. Uh, Son of Man, just that part of the phrase is textually secure. Now, there are additions to that. You know, the who is in heaven is one of those. And then there'll be other, uh, some manuscripts will have that, others won't have that. Um, something like Metzger's textual commentary, you know, will address that. Um, I, l looking at the textual evidence, who is in heaven, again, is in terms of manuscript data, probably uh, a, a little better little better off, you know, man, in terms of manuscript data than the alternative, than not having something there. Uh, I don't think it's a specific reference, though, to to Daniel 7, uh, you know, who is in heaven. You know, it, 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 it could be, you know, in John, you know, son of man who is in heaven, the human one who's in heaven. I mean, el elsewhere, son of man, you know, is pretty, pretty generic. If who is in heaven you know, is, is the correct reading. It might be an allusion uh, to that figure. But uh, again, there, there, are other, there are other ways you could, you could look at it. You could just say, first of all, you could deny the who is in heaven part. Then you're just stuck with son of man. That's very generic. You know, it, even if you have it, son of man, you know, who, who is in heaven, Jesus may not, you know, you, I'm not saying I read it this way, but people could read that and say, well, you know, Jesus is not really identifying himself with, with that or something to that, that effect. Uh, I think it's it, it it's possible that it's an allusion to Daniel seven. What I would really want to sort of feel better about it is some reference to the clouds, uh, that that sort of thing. Now you could say, well, come, you know, in heaven, clouds. You know, it, it's kind of six of one, half dozen another. Okay, but but you have passages also from John, like John six forty one, where you have the you have the Son of Man who you know, has come down from heaven. Okay, well. Uh, again, that that's not really – people wouldn't really process that as a fulfillment of Daniel 7 because you're missing the everlasting kingship stuff, you know, giving you – know, being handed dominion over the nations of the world and all that. And it, it's the same thing here in, in John you know, 3.13. So I, I would say that there's some possibility in, in, in these more generic passages that maybe the, the Daniel 7 is lurking in the background, but I certainly wouldn't – uh, say that the writer is sort of viewing this as some kind of tight identification or, or we're moving toward fulfillment of that idea. I think that does come later. Uh, Jesus gets more explicit uh, when he's on trial uh, before Caiaphas. He, there's a more secure quotation of Daniel 7 there. So that's the way I would approach it. I would say well, there, there, there's some possibility here. There's, there's some things I wish I'd like to see that would make it a little bit tighter. But I think it's, a, it's at least possible. Samuel from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, has a question that was prompted from episode 70 on an answer you gave. And he wants to know what happens to the Holy Spirit if mm -hmm. someone turns their back on God. Does the Holy Spirit leave? Yeah, I would say, um, okay, he referenced the earlier episode. We've done more recent things that are in the same area, you know, same theological topic as this question. So I would say, you know, just generally, it'd probably be a good, a good thing to do to listen to some of the other episodes. But for this one, let's just say this. I would say that the, the New Testament says the Holy Spirit can be grieved and quenched. Again, the Holy Spirit indwells us to mark us and marking us is, is how I take the sealing language uh, of certain passages, sealed with the Holy Spirit. I think that refers to being marked, uh, sort of marked out from others. Not, I don't take it in terms of, 
of having some irreversible status on you. So I think the Holy Spirit indwells us to mark us as believers and to sanctify us and assist us in walking with the Lord. His presence doesn't guarantee that people will not turn from belief. Else the writer of Hebrews and other writers in the New Testament would have no reason to be concerned. The very fact that they're concerned that people not turn from the faith tells you, or at least it ought to tell you, that the sealing language of the Holy Spirit is not about making it impossible for people to turn away from the faith. Certainly the New Testament writers are not reading the language that way because they are concerned. So either, either you know, we, we should, as it were, walk up to them and say, hey, you know, Hebrews guy and, you know, Paul or whoever else it is, don't, don't worry. Don't, don't you guys realize that, that once you have the Holy Spirit, that, that turning from the faith is impossible, so you don't need to worry. It's very obviously not what's, that's not what's going on in the New Testament. And it's, 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 I would say it's painfully obvious. Anyway, in, in Ephesians 4.30, you know, given that little backdrop, in Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit. We have to presume, and, and again, just reading it sort of gives us the impression that it is possible that the Spirit can be grieved. Further, and this is a little digging a little bit deeper, the grieving language of the Holy Spirit might come from Isaiah 63.10, because the language is the same there. They rebelled, they grieved His Holy Spirit. And the rest of the verse says, therefore he, the Holy Spirit, turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. This is Israel in the wilderness wanderings, you know, where, where God gets angry, uh, you know, at the Israelites for their reaction. You know, they, they just, they grieve the Spirit, they turn away, you know, they rebel, all this kind of stuff. Well, again, if that could happen in the Old Testament, and if Ephesians 4 is quoting this passage about grieving the Spirit, well, that, that says something. It, it, it's possible that the grieving language does come from that passage, and if so, then the Holy Spirit can act in judgment against a person who abandons faith. You know, that's just kind of scriptural math there. First Thessalonians 5.19, quench not, you know, quench not the Holy Spirit. This is the same verb lemma, the one translated quench, as in Ephesians 6.16, where, where the fiery darts from the evil one are extinguished. Again, same lemma. It would seem that belief— and the ministry of the Holy Spirit positively to a believer are intertwined. They are interrelated. That's another way of saying, if, if you want the ministry of the Holy Spirit to work out in your life, you need to believe. So we're all, we're back to square one again. Okay, you need to believe. If this is a concern to New Testament writers, that believers forsake their faith, they turn against and away from the God of Israel, from the gospel, against the gospel. That seems to be a, a very transparent concern in the New Testament. And for that reason, if that is a concern, and it's not hard to find, I mean, we, we truck through a number of passages in the book of Hebrews. If that's the case, then what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, the Holy Spirit could judge them. He could be the agent of judgment. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean, and it didn't mean in the Old Testament, that the Spirit of God never has a positive you know, ministry to that person. He certainly did with the nation of Israel. Why would we expect in, in, you know, on, the, on the other side, in the New Testament, for the Spirit of God to not also try to draw them back? Again, we talked about that in Hebrews as well. That, that one of the ministries of the Spirit of God is, is to, to work in the heart of a person to help them to believe, to keep them in the faith. But the Spirit can be quenched. The Spirit can be, again, grieved. We, we don't really like to to talk about these kind of verses again it's it's largely because of the theology that sort of we have in our back in our background that makes us look at these passages passages and sort of conclude that turning from the faith wasn't a real problem that would have been news to the new testament writers otherwise why are they writing about it and in the case of the writer of hebrews why is he hung up on it well the answer is you know the context the persecution the, just the hardship this was a real concern. It was not a fabricated concern. It's not a theologically misguided concern. It's in the New Testament. And by virtue of it, you know, the whole idea of inspiration, I would say it's a valid concern. So the bottom line is that, again, the writer of Hebrews, other writers are either genuinely concerned about people abandoning the faith, or they're not, or they're, or they're dumb, or they're just theologically inept. I don't think they were dumb or theologically inept. 
I think this is a real concern. So if people cannot turn from the faith, these concerns are illegitimate. The writers are making some sort of theological error. I don't think they're in error. If they can, if people can turn from the faith, then the presence of the Spirit is about something else other than guaranteeing that people can't turn away. <laughs> Again, this is, this is very simple, step-by-step -step logic. You know, thinking about what we read in the text, I'll repeat it. If people can turn away from the faith, and that seems to be a, a big concern for certain writers in the New Testament, if they can turn away, then the presence of the Spirit is about something else besides guaranteeing that people who profess Christ can never reject that belief. It's pretty evident, again, the writers are really concerned about it, so it would seem that we should take their concern seriously. We don't want the Spirit of God, who is, again, working to keep us in the faith. We don't want the, the Spirit of God to have to judge us, uh, to have to chastise us, be the agent of chastisement. You know, uh, Maybe that's for our own good, because the Spirit of God will, as he did in the Old Testament with the Israelites, who were cantankerous and rebellious uh, across their history. The Spirit of God did you know, act on occasion, you know, as, a, as a, an agent of judgment, but he also acted, you know, on other occasions as the agent that, that God would use to draw them back, you know, through various means back to himself. All right, Mike. Well, that's all of our questions for this episode. So hopefully we can ask one more question of ourselves, and that's to please say a prayer for us while we're in Israel, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Pray for safe travel and, uh, Appreciate you answering our questions. And again, send me your questions at tracestrickland at gmail.com. I will put them in the queue uh, to be hopefully answered at a future point in time. But uh, with that, Mike, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.